Chapter 1, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. In the year 1878, I took my degree of Doctor of Medicine of the University of London and proceeded to go through the course prescribed for the surgeons in the army. Having completed my studies there, I was duly attached to the 5th Northumberland as assistant surgeon. The regiment was stationed in India at the time, and before I could join it, the second Afghan war had broken out. On landing at Bombay, I learned that my corps had advanced through the passes and was already deep in the enemy's country. I followed, however, with many other officers who were in the same situation as myself and succeeded in reaching Kandahar in safety, where I found my regiment and once entered upon my new duties. The campaign brought honors and promotions to many, but for me, it had nothing but misfortune and disaster. I was removed from my brigade and attached to the Berkshires, with whom I served at the fatal Battle of Maywand. There I was struck in the shoulder by a bullet, which shattered the bone and grazed the subclavian artery. Had it not been for the devotion and courage shown by Murray, my orderly, who threw me across the pack horse and succeeded in bringing me safely to the British lines. Worn with pain and weak from the prolonged hardships which I had undergone, I was removed to the base hospital in Peshawar. Here I rallied and had already improved so far as to be able to walk that a medical board determined that a, not a day should be lost and send me back to England. I was dispatched accordingly to the troop ship and landed a month later on Portsmouth Jetty with my health irrevocably ruined, but with my permission from a paternal government to spend the next nine months in an attempt to improve it. Under such circumstances, I naturally gravitated to London, that I soon realized that I must either leave the metropolis and rusticate somewhere in the country, or that I must make a complete alteration in my style of living. Choosing the latter alternative, I began by making up my mind to leave the hotel and to take up my quarters in some less pretentious and less expensive domicile. On the very day that I had come to this conclusion, I was standing in the Criterion Bar and someone tapped me on the shoulder and turning around, I recognized young Stanford, who had been a dresser under me at Bart's. The sign of a friendly face in the great wilderness of London is a pleasant thing indeed to a lonely man. Whatever have you been doing with yourself, Watson? He asked. You are as thin as a leaf and uh, brown as a nut. I gave him a short sketch of my adventures. What are you up to now? Looking for lodgings, I answered. That's a strange thing. You're the second man today to, that used that expression. And who was the first, I asked. A fellow who is working at the chemical laboratory up at the hospital. I should uh, prefer having a partner to being alone. You don't know Sherlock Holmes yet, he said. Perhaps you would not care for him and he has a constant companion. Why? When is uh, there against him? Oh, I didn't say there was anything against him. He is a little queer in his ideas. I should like to meet him, I said. If I am to lodge with anybody, I would prefer a man of studious and quiet habits. I am not strong enough yet to stand much noise or excitement. I had enough of both in Afghanistan to last me for the remainder of my natural existence. How could I meet this friend of yours? He is sure to be at the laboratory, returned my companion. He either avoids the place for weeks or else he works there from morning to night. If you like, we shall drive around together after luncheon. You mustn't blame me if you don't want to get on with him, he said. I know nothing more of him than I have learned from meeting him occasionally in the laboratory. You proposed this arrangement, so you must not hold me responsible. If we know not get on it, it will be easy to part company, I answered. 
It seems to me, Stanford, I added, looking hard at my companion, that you have some reason for washing your hands of the matter. He appears to have a passion for definite and exact knowledge. But here we are, and you must form your own impression about him. There was only one student in the room. At the sound of our steps, he glanced around and sprang to his feet with a cry of pleasure. I found it! I found it, he shouted to to my companion, running towards us with a test tube in his hand. I have found a reagent, which is precipitated by hemoglobin and by nothing else. Had he discovered a gold mine, greater delight could not have shown upon his features. Dr. Watson, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, said Stanford, introduced us. How are you? He said cordially, gripping my hand with strength for which I could hardly have given him credit. Clapping his hands and looking as delighted as a child with the new toys. What do you think of that? It seems to be a very delicate test, I remarked, sticking a small piece of plaster over the prick on his finger. I have to be careful, he continued, turning to me with a smile, for I dabble with poisons a great deal. We came over on business, said Stanford, sitting down on a high three legged stool and pushing another one in my direction with his foot. My friend here wants to take diggings, and you were complaining that you had no one to go halves with you. I thought I had better bring you two together. Sherlock Holmes seems delighted at the idea of sharing his rooms with me. I have my eye on a sweet and baker street, he said, which would suit us down to the ground. You don't mind the smell of strong tobacco, I hope. I always uh, smoke ships myself, I answered. That's good enough. I generally have chemicals about and occasionally do experiments. Would that annoy you? By no means. Let me see. One of my other shortcomings. I get into the dumps at times and don't open my mouth for days on end. You must not think I am sulky when I do that. Just let me alone and I'll soon be right. What have you to confess now? It's just as well two fellows to know the worst of one another before they begin to live together. I laughed at his cross-examination, and I get up at all sorts of ungodly hours, and I am extremely lazy. I have another set of vices when I'm well, but those are the principal ones at present. Do you include violin playing? I answered. A well-played violin is a treat for the gods. A badly played one? Oh, that's all right, he cried with a merry laugh. I think we may consider the thing settled. That is, if the rooms are agreeable to you. When shall we see them? Call for me here at noon tomorrow, and we'll go over together and settle everything, he answered. All right, noon exactly, said I, shaking his hand. By the way, I asked, suddenly stopping and turning upon Stanford. How the deuce did he know that I had come from Afghanistan? My companion smiled an enigmatic smile. That's just his little peculiarity, he said. A good many people have wanted to know how he finds things out. Oh, a mystery, is it? Oh, you must study him, Stanford said as he bade me goodbye. You'll find him a naughty problem, though. I'll wager he learns more about you than you about him. Goodbye. Goodbye, I answered, and strolled on to my hotel, considerably interested in my new acquaintance.